Welcome everybody. Thanks for uh, joining our workshop tonight. Uh, so if you don't know me, my picture's right up there. Uh, my name is Stacy. I work with Evo Real Real Estate. I'm a broker there. Um, and then Tony. I'm Tony, I'm with Heritage Home Loans. And uh, we're here to help you get your offer accepted. In this crazy, crazy market that we have right now. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what the market's like, um, what lending looks like right now, uh, some tips on you know, what you can do to get a leg up both with your lender and having conversations with your realtor um, and writing up an offer that can be accepted uh, in this market and just all the ins and outs of kind of that whole process. So what's with the market? Um, there's, there's a couple of things. One, uh, and we'll start with high demand because that, that's part of the issue too. It's not just that there aren't houses for sale. Um, it's that there's a lot more people that want to buy them. One, uh, COVID has changed the way people think about their homes. Um, it's changed the way that people in apartments want to be in apartments, all those kind of things, just because we've been stuck at home. So uh, there's more people that are trying to move that way. Um, lower interest rates for the past year have made people think that they can afford a little bit bigger house, a little bit better house, uh, all those kind of things. Uh, and then the majority of millennials, and I don't know the exact number, but the majority of millennials are entering their prime home buying years. So, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about 2008, but this is the exact opposite of that, where uh, the, the household formations was going down at that point. Now it's going up and will keep continue to go up for the next few years. So we can expect this kind of, uh, in a sense, demand for housing uh, over the next, I would say four or five years at least. On top of that, with all those people wanting to buy houses, there aren't houses to buy. Um, <laughs> You know, one of the things that we're facing in Spokane is like, um, and Stacy might be able to talk on this a little bit more, but there's limits to one, just having land to build on, but two, there's government restrictions on um, where you can build, because I, I don't know the exact law, um, but there's just, there's limits on where you can build, places to build, so it's, it's that. Um, it's also super expensive to build now because the price of lumber's gone way up. So building houses, they're just not affordable for first time home buyers, which are a third of the market. People are aging in place, possibly because of the pandemic, possibly because they have a great interest rate, their house is paid off, they don't have a payment uh, and all those kind of things. So high, high demand, low supply, create a super fast market and a hard market to get your offer accepted. Yeah, I think that Tony touches on a good point. I mean, it, it really does come down to the basic nature of supply and demand. Um, and he mentioned something uh, a few minutes ago about working from home. And that's kind of been a big catalyst for a lot of the demands because it's not just people working in our local market that are now working from home. You have people that are coming from the West side uh, or coming from California, coming from all over that are now able to work from home and they're making the same salary and they're deciding that they want to live in a place that has a lower cost of living. And Spokane is one of those places. So uh, it, what it does is kind of creates this chain reaction of um, people, let's say selling their houses in California, having a ton of cash to come into our market with. Um, and I've seen it several times where, you know, people have bid up the, the cost for a house or the price for a house because they have the cash to do so. And that's kind of created this hyper inflated um, buyer's market, if you will. And we can touch on that a little bit later, but that's why lately we're seeing all of these offers being over asking price and still maybe not getting the house. Um, there's lots of different reasons for that, but that's kind of 
been the new norm um, lately, at least. And it, it's for a multitude of reasons, but that, you know, that's a big one is people coming in from outside of our area and wanting to live here. We don't blame them, but uh, at the same time, it's just created this big, big, big demand. And we just have not had the supply uh, to meet that. Uh, and so like, I guess this, like, as I'm listening to us talk, I'm like, why would I ever buy a house? But I, I think uh, one of the things we need to think about is, and if you were on this before, uh, I think Sarah and Sarah were on as we were kind of talking about interest rates. Um, interest rates are, while they're a little bit higher than they were a couple of weeks ago, um, they're pretty close to historic lows. Um, and so at the end of the day, like in a year or two, when rates go up, it's going to be ugly and, and rates are going to go up a little bit. And I can talk a little bit about what I think, like throughout the summer, they're going to, rates are going to go a little bit higher. Then they're going to come back down after, um, kind of, I think things kind of settle in after the, the economy reopens, assuming that it does, um, but the reality is, is it, let's say a, if a home price, if a, the price of a home goes up a thousand dollars, you can th you can think that that's going to add about six dollars to your monthly payment. Okay, um, if the rate goes up a quarter of a percent, your payment's going to go up around nineteen dollars per quarter or per eighth of a percent. So rates move a lot faster. And I said 1000 I meant $10,000. Um, rates move significantly faster. They move every day. Right now, the market's volatile. So like if you come and ask me for a quote today on a rate, it's going to be different today than it will be tomorrow. Not a ton, but there'll be differences. Uh, home prices are kind of like, they move slower in my mind. They, they, it takes a month or so or two months for home prices to go up. Now, obviously the, the multiple offers and all those kind of things, home prices can go pretty quick, but um, homes, because rates are low, homes are a little bit more affordable than they were actually last year at this time because the rates are lower, even though home prices have gone up like 10%. So um, is it affordable? It might not seem like it when you just look at the, the price of a home, but as you think about like, interest rates and all those kind of things, uh, it's more affordable today than it was uh, on March, today's the ninth, right? On March 9th of last year. Um, again, with home prices moving up. So, um, but again, that's not gonna last forever. That rates aren't gonna stay down forever. Uh, as the economy gets going, they'll go up a little bit. Um, hey, Tony. Yeah. Tony, real quick, I just noticed a technical thing. Um, I think that you're sharing your screen or trying to, but it's stuck on a slide for me. So I was wondering if maybe we might be able to like unshare and then reshare back again. There you go. I was, yeah, I'm sorry. No worries. I just want everybody else you to don't share. So have a visual. <laughs> uh, so here's all the slides we were going through. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there it is. <laughs> I've, been, so I've been watching myself present, right? <laughs> Uh, well, the good part is we haven't gotten into the, the meat of it yet, so. Yeah, uh, so we were on the kind of the housing bubble. And once in, in the, in your guys' office meeting, we were talking about this this morning, and I think it's important for uh, potential home buyers to know. Um, the reality is, is you're probably gonna have to, to make an offer a little bit over asking. And with that being said, people are starting to go like, is this this is this 2008 all over again? Or am I if I buy a house, am I going to lose all my all the equity I have in it, all the value of the house over the next few years? Um, it's obviously we can't predict that for sure, right? Like, you know, a year ago, if you would ask me if I had to stay at home for the next year, uh, I probably would have said no, right? But we don't we don't know this for sure, but evidence suggests because this is the opposite in terms like I was talking about with um, 
home formations and millennials being in their prime home buying age. Um, Spokane is a place where people are moving to because it's affordable. Um, it's affordable to those people. It doesn't seem affordable as affordable to us. Um, and then the simple supply and demand stuff. Uh, this, this is kind of in a sense way different than uh, what 2008 was. As a lender, there's way more things we have to do to pre-approve you. Um, it's a lot. It's a lot harder to get a loan. There's all those kind of things that didn't exist in 2008 that exist now. To, to I think, as a home buyer, you can feel comfortable that you're not going to lose your shorts as you buy a house. Now something crazy could happen, so don't quote me on that if it does happen. Like, uh, but. I, I think you can feel comfortable because of those reasons. Stacey. When you say harder to get a loan, that, that kind of that scares me a little bit. What is that? What do you mean? Well, in 2008, at the end of the day, you could walk in and go like, hey, here's my pay stub, give me money, and they would give it to you. Or you could say it like they had all those loans where if you didn't have a job, you just had a driver's license, you could get a loan. What I mean by now is like, you have to have a job you have to have a, a decent credit score. You don't have to have a perfect credit score. Um, those kind of like, there's an actual application process you have to go through that you didn't necessarily have to go through back then. Um, and you, you, can't, you can't just make up what you make for a monthly income, all those kind of things. So with that, it's, I shouldn't say it's, it's harder. It's just, there's a process you have to go through now that, um, that you didn't necessarily have to go through back then, which was one of the problems. And I get that question a lot actually, is, is people you know, wondering if we're in a bubble because prices just keep going up. And I think that they equate the prices going up with a bubble and they think that that bubble is going to burst like it did before. So a lot of the times what I explain to people is that there was a lot of reasons that you know, the bubble burst uh, back then. And one of them, to echo Tony's point, was there was a lot of predatory lending practices. Um, and there wasn't a lot of kind of regulation when it came to a lot of lenders. So it was simpler, not necessarily easier, but simpler to get a home loan. Um, and some of these predatory lenders uh, would kind of do a bit of a bait and switch and so you'd think that you were paying one thing and then um, the loan product that they sold you uh, was such that your payment would keep going up and up and up. And then all of a sudden you couldn't afford your payment anymore. So I definitely think that was part of it. Um, and I think that the, the general market was a lot more volatile back then as well. And right now, you know, prices are higher than they have been. Prices are going up um, and they are being inflated by a lot of cash buyers. And that's unfortunate, but it's the reality that we live in. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the market's gonna crash and everybody's gonna lose their homes and there's gonna be tons of foreclosures, um, especially in the local Spokane market and the surrounding areas. I think that one of the things that lends to the idea of this market isn't going anywhere anytime soon is Spokane's growth. And Spokane continues to have new construction, not necessarily just custom homes, but developments and communities. And Spokane is bringing a lot of jobs to our community. Uh, there are companies that keep coming here, you know, opening up factories or stores or what have you, and that's creating jobs and that's bringing more people here. And there is not a lot, but there's room for expansion in Spokane and the surrounding areas. And so as long as the Spokane community is thriving and building and growing, that's going to continue to bring people here, especially if, you know, the cost of living is moderate compared to some of the other places that they might live. Uh, and in, in my mind, at least, you know, as on the realtor side, not the lending side, as long as that's happening, then that kind of means that projections are that the, the housing market is going to keep growing with the local market as well. Um, and that means that there is no bubble that's going to burst. It's just, it's, 
we're going to keep growing. We're going to keep getting bigger. And when we talk about that supply and demand thing, you're bringing in more and more and more demand. And we just need to have that supply to kind of meet it. People selling their homes, whether that's developers building new communities with new homes, you know, there's a lot of, of questions there. But so long as kind of that ratio is uneven, then I personally don't foresee our, our market going anywhere anytime soon, which is a good thing if you are buying a home, because that means that you're building equity uh, and that you're investing in yourself. So, so let's talk, uh, like now we've obviously scared you, right? Like <laughs> you're never going to be able to buy a house. Let's talk about how you buy a house. Let's talk about how you get your offer accepted um, and make sure you walk away feeling like, hey, we can do this. The reason we go, th I think, through the kind of the, the scary stuff at the beginning is like, it's a reality that it's tough out there. Um, so at the end of the day, we got to uh, um, be prepared. Stacy, why don't you talk about because you're out there with the buyers more often, just talk about what it's like out there. Yeah, for sure. Um, it can be really intimidating, honestly, and it can be really scary if you're a first time home buyer or maybe you're not a first time home buyer, but maybe you haven't bought a house in a while, especially in this market. Um, it, there's a lot happening and it's happening really fast. Uh, and so as a buyer, you have to kind of be prepared to move quickly and make quick decisions um, because let me just kind of paint you an example. It's kind of standard these days that you get a pre-approval from your lender before you go look at a house. And you definitely need one before you offer on a house because most uh, listing agents and most sellers are gonna require that anyway. But here's a potential scenario in that you don't quite have your proof yet, but you're so excited to start the process. You want to go start looking at houses. So you set out for the day with your realtor to go see five houses. And the first one that you see, that's the one you want. It's your dream house. It's the perfect price. It's the perfect size. It has a perfect yard. It's everything you want and you want to offer on it. Well, in order to submit your offer, you have to know if you can afford that house. So you need to have that conversation with your lender. And the pre-approval that you get is a result of that conversation with your lender and your application and all that. So let's say that you want to offer on the house, but you don't realize that your payment is going to be twice as much as you need it to be or want it to be. Um, so that means you can't get the house. Or let's say you're so excited, you go to, to get a hold of your lender, to get your pre-approval, start the ball rolling. And the next day that house has already been scooped up by somebody else. And that is the reality of the market right now. Things are just moving fast. And as a buyer, I'm sure you've probably been watching realtor.com or Zillow or any of those apps and you see a house you like, and maybe you favorite it, and then you go the next day or two days later to check on it, and it's gone. It's pending. Um, people are scooping up houses sometimes in 24 hours or less. Um, sometimes it's a couple of days. And ultimately, what if it is on the market a couple of days, generally speaking, it's in a multiple offer situation, meaning a lot of people are offering on the same house. And so that's kind of what we're talking about here is how to be competitive in that situation. But coming back to the point of avoiding the rush is if you have a plan in place and if you take the steps early to create that plan, then you're in a much better position for when you are ready to start searching. And let's say you find that perfect house, you've got your pre-approval ready to go, everything is is on point and you can submit your offer and you're going to kind of know what to expect when you know how much you're going to offer right around what your payment's going to be if you need to offer over asking you can kind of have an expectation for that as well versus having to scramble um, and risk not being prepared uh, when you finally do find the house that, that you want to like and you want to offer on 
And then I think Tony, uh, he has some pointers on things that you can do to prepare on the lending side as well. I got something to add to that that I don't think most people know about is I think it was a year ago that MLS actually changed uh, that your status from pending inspection uh, used to be still active. So on Zillow, you'd see all these houses available, available, but they weren't, they weren't, they were just as unavailable as they are. They just weren't shown as uh, available active mm -hmm. because of that chain, that one change. That is true. And um, that's actually in a weird roundabout way, a little bit more helpful now that they do show them as pending sooner because a lot of buyers out there, they, they use these apps, they use Realtor and they use Zillow and they use Trulia um, to look for houses. And back then, uh, last year, they were like, oh, I love all these houses. And as the Realtor, I would have to go check the MLS because that has the most accurate and up-to-date data. And nine times out of 10, the ones that they liked would be pending already. So these apps are getting better at uh, reflecting a truer level of detail. Um, they're never perfect. That's why we always are going to have you set up uh, in the MLS with a search because that is where the information hits first. Um, but they're getting a little bit better. Uh, so lending tests, Stacy talked about the pre-approval. I, I think that's fairly obvious, right? Like we all know that or should know that that if i'm going to buy a house i have to have a pre-approval like first thing you if you were to meet with stacy to talk about hey i want to buy a house that's probably the first thing she's going to tell you um and so i, I don't want to go into that process other than for the most part it should go pretty quick the, the problem is is it's not just about in this market in my opinion it's not necessarily just about getting pre-approved it's about hey, what's my goal payment? And what does that mean in a purchase price? Like if my goal payment is $1,500, what is it, how much, how much home can I afford? What's the purchase price of a home I can get? And then, so, and that comes back to maybe communicating with the realtor and going like, hey, I can afford, I'm just throwing out numbers, 300,000, right? And that gets me my $1,500 payment goal. I'm not quoting a payment. So don't quote, like, I, don't get me in trouble on that. Okay. But that's what that means, right? Well, so Stacy's going to go, well, we need, if you're going to get a house at 300, then we probably need to shop at 275 because you're probably going to have to offer over. Well, what happens if my dream home is 300,000 and I have to offer 325? And that takes my payment to, I'm going to say 2000 because I'm trying to really get my payments off base. So you know what I'm talking about. And I'm not out of, I don't get in trouble for it. Um, that takes me to 2000, but that's the, that's the max I'm willing to go. So th that's having a, dis it's not just about like, Hey, yeah, you can buy a house. It's about, I want to try and keep my payment around $1,500 because I'm comfortable doing that. But if my dream home with, you know, my Barbie dream house, shows up and it and I have to pay 325 for it, I could still afford that as long as it's my dream house. And so I think that kind of like you need to take that pre-approval a little bit further, just so you know heading out, this is about how much home, this is where I want to try and be. But if I need to go a little bit over, I can go up to this amount, but not a not a penny more or whatever, or I'm going to be broke and this is going to I'm just going to sit in my house and, and eat, you know, Campbell's soup all day or whatever. So those kind of things I think are a big deal as you head out. Um, and then I think like there's some people, you know, there's certain loan programs that may be a little bit harder. Um, so it's okay to maybe shop while you're out. Like, you know, a down payment assistance loan is a little bit harder to get your offer accepted. I'm not saying you shouldn't try, but there may be some things to do, like maybe while you're shopping and if you're struggling, you're, you're really putting money away or doing whatever you can do to kind of change your loan program. Let's say you're a certain loan program, but you can improve your loan status while you're shopping, whether that's doing some credit repair or doing those kind of things. Like 
All of these kind of things are going to help you, put you in a better position. And that's not to say that you can't shop while you're doing them. It's just important that you like, hey, let's start here because the homes are moving so fast. You don't want to not be in the market. But let's see if we can improve my standing and maybe save some money uh, as we're out there. So I would say obviously get pre-approved, but talk about how much can I afford goal payment? How much can I afford uh, max payment? What can I do to improve my standing as we're going out there? So maybe in two months, I can afford a little bit more if as home prices go up and those kind of things. Um, Stace. So then uh, number three over there on the screen talks about real estate tasks. And in kind of the beginning of the process, after you have your pre-approval and you kind of know where you want your payment to be, um, you need to have a serious conversation um, with your realtor about the things that are important to you in a house. And I call them wants and needs, right? And obviously I'm not proprietary to that, but um, you know, there are certain things when it comes to shopping for a house that are needs, and then obviously certain things that are wants. And in any real estate market, let alone in kind of the one that we're in now, it's hard sometimes to get all of your wants and all of your needs. Um, you hear the term to get thrown around a lot, you know, this house checks off all of my boxes or most of my boxes. And generally that is referring to wants and needs. You know, if you need to have three bedrooms, that's a non-negotiable. If you want to have a fenced yard, that maybe can be negotiable because you can always put in a fence. You can't necessarily add a third bedroom. So having a conversation with your realtor uh, about your basic needs, like these are my must haves and then talking with them about how well these things would also be nice, but they're not, you know, um, they're not a need necessarily. And the big things are going to be, obviously, aside from your needs, what part of town you want to be in, because that's a big one, uh, and then price, right? And we're not in a kind of market right now where we can run a search for over your price thinking, well, the prices will come down if it's on the market for X amount of days. That might be the case with some houses, but for the most part, it's not going to be like that. Uh, if a house is on the market for more than, let's just call it 10 days, uh, it's not super likely that they're going to have a big reduction in price so that they're meeting what your price range is. Again, it kind of goes back to just this frenzy of the market that we're in right now. Most homes are going under contract and they're going into pending status within no less than seven days on average. Uh, sometimes it's one day, sometimes it's two days. You see what I mean? There's a trend here. These houses are going really fast. That's why you hear the terms low inventory. That means it's not that nobody's listing houses. It means that houses are being listed and they're being bought up super fast and they're not staying on the market. Um, and that goes back to what I was talking about earlier with having to move quickly. If you want to be in this sort of competition, <laughs> as it were, then you have to move quickly. But before you can move quickly, you have to have a plan of action. And between your finances and your lender and your realtor and knowing what you need in a house, that all kind of completes the picture of having your plan of action. And all it is, is having conversations, right? Um, with, you know, client X, if they tell me I need to be on the South Hill and I need three bedrooms and two baths and my max budget is $300,000, then I can very easily plug that search for them. And as a realtor, you know, I can maybe play around with, well, maybe they're not counting one of the bedrooms that's in the basement you know so I that's my job is to look for these things when it comes to your wants and needs list but having that plan of action and knowing that at any point in time if a house pops up that meets all of your, your criteria we got to be ready to go you know not necessarily in an hour but that day or maybe the next day it's it's all about just 
putting those plans into place and being ready and all of that to-do list items get you there. Yeah, I think I see people make big mistakes when they limit their search to a confined set of this is what I need to like to the nth degree because you you miss opportunities like, well, I need a shop, but mm -hmm. I look at a property that is $40,000 less that has the room for a shop where I could build a nice shop, right? I got a brand new shop with that, the amount of money that I just saved on buying this home I just overlooked. That's very true. And, you know, depending on what your price range is, um, you can, uh, buyers in this kind of market can't really be super picky about minor things. Like let's say a fenced yard, right? Because you might pass up on a really good house that actually works for you. And it might not have a fence, but let's say that it, or it might not be fully fenced on all sides. You might just need to add one stretch of fence. And maybe you don't have the funds to do that. That's fine. That's another conversation. But if even there's a possibility that that house might work for you and it's not fully fenced, you don't want to limit yourself by not even potentially seeing it. Um, and so it helps to actually start off your search with a wider range of options. Start with more and then you can always whittle it down if you need to. Um, but if you start too specific, then you, you narrow yourself and you might wind up missing out on a lot of places uh, that you don't have any idea about them probably until they're picked up by somebody else. I remember uh, like this was a few years ago before the market was, it, it was, it was, it was crazy at that time, but um, my wife and I were looking at a house uh, and we need, we needed a fenced backyard because of the dog. And there was some other stuff with this house, but I remember walking into it and there was, we walked into an open house and there was like, it was packed. Right. And I remember the realtor in that place saying like, hey, we're reviewing offers tonight at 5 p.m. And this is on a Saturday. And it had just got on the market on Friday or whatever. And we left and we said to ourselves, hey, we need to make an offer on this house. I remember feeling like we had to make an offer on that house when we were in it. And when we got home, we sat down and we're like, that doesn't like it does not only does it not check all the like check all the boxes it does it only checks like one but it's just i remember feeling that pressure and that was because one the market made us feel that way but when we went home and sat down and we're like okay we're gonna have to offer this much then we went back to that list that we created and we're like man it, it doesn't make sense to do this we're just we don't get caught up in the market go back to i made this list this is how much I can afford, or this is my goal. And if it doesn't, if that doesn't work, even though you looked at it, you don't have to make an offer. Um, but you, I, go ahead. Sorry, um, I was just gonna echo that. I think it's really easy to kind of get caught up in this market and to feel like you have to offer on a house that isn't perfect. But when I'm with my clients, I always kind of paint the same scenario for everybody. You know, it depends on your personal situation and how soon you need to move. And need is the key word there because you either need to move or you want to move. Um, and if you need to move, then that creates urgency. Uh, whereas if you want to move, you might not have the same urgency. You might have a little bit of time to kind of, you know, make sure that you find the house, the perfect house for you. But if you have that urgency of need to move, then when you're going to look at these houses, you know, I always ask my clients to grade the houses on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the best, one being the worst. And then I ask them to compare that to their urgency scale, right? And if they're giving the house, you know, a nine or 10 out of 10, and their urgency scale is, you know, kind of zeroing in on them, then there's really no reason if the house, you know, checks their boxes that they shouldn't offer on that house. Now, if their urgency scale is a little bit lower and the house is like maybe a six, then I ask them to kind of delve a little bit deeper and think, okay, well, you don't love the house and you don't have to be in a house right away 
you know, really think about, is this the house that you can envision yourself in, um, you know, for the next, however long you plan on being in the house? Because for some people, they're looking for a short-term house. Some people are looking for a retirement house. Everybody's situation is different. And it's easy to feel the pressure, especially in this kind of market, because you just want to get a house and you want to get a house before interest rates go up more. And, you know, you just, you kind of need to be part of that pack. Well, that's maybe partially true, but it also should make sense. Um, And I'm a very pragmatic person. I'm a realist. And I try to talk to my clients in that vein as well. And just be like, okay, let, let's come back down to earth a little bit, you know, and, and think about this realistically. Is this a smart decision? Is it a wise decision? Or are you making um, a decision that's more based off of emotion um, and panic? Because you never want to do that. Uh, I don't ever want my people to get into a situation where they regret, you know, their house purchase because they felt that they just had to do it. Um, so it's, it's this fine balance of, yes, you need to move and act quickly, but it should also be for the right reasons. Um, and having a person in the middle, like a realtor, uh, is a good way to help balance that because they should be talking to you about these things. They should be the ones to bring you back to earth. They should be the ones to have you thinking about all of the logistics, um, and the reasons that you're making this decision. And so on this next slide here, I want to talk a little bit about how we can structure an offer um, to best put put your best foot forward, right? To to get your offer accepted is the bottom line. Um, And if you've never bought a house before, if it's been a while, then part of the offer, uh, offer package are multiple contingencies. And inspection, appraisal, financing, um, you know, how long until closing, those are all different things that you can amend in your offer uh, based on lots of things, right? Based on what the seller is looking for, based on what your needs are. You know, you might need a 60 day closing, but the seller might need to be out of the house in 30 days. Um, you might want to have your standard 10 day inspection period. Well, in order to be competitive, you know, maybe, and I've seen this a lot lately, people are putting really small inspection periods, sometimes seven days, five days, three days. So there are different ways that your realtor can structure your offer to make it competitive. Now, you would have to have a private conversation with them, again, based on your needs and for them to really explain to you what the benefits are to revising these contingencies and what the potential pitfalls are. Um, Because anytime you make an offer and if your offer is accepted, you're going to be paying earnest money. Earnest money, call it like a down payment on your down payment, right? And earnest money is generally about 1% or so of the purchase price of the house. And if you as a buyer break these contingencies, uh, you have the potential to lose that earnest money. Now it's your realtor's job to make sure that doesn't happen. And if you have a good realtor, they will do that. But it's also their job to explain to you what to do and what not to do to make sure that you don't lose that earnest money. And so these contingencies kind of all go back to the earnest money and to the contract. As a benefit to you, the buyer, these contingencies usually have timeframes to complete them. And if you need to back out of a contract for some reason, these contingencies are there for you to do so within the appropriate amount of time, and then you get your earnest money back. But if you fail to do that within the timelines of some of these contingencies, again, you have the possibility of losing your earnest money. So when we talk about inspection, you know, you always want to have your house inspected. I've seen lately some people are waiving their inspections just because they want to be competitive in this market. 
ultimately that's going to be your call. We don't ever advise that because you need to know what you're walking into. You need somebody who's an unbiased third party that's going to inspect the house from top to bottom. Um, so if you don't want to waive your inspection, you know, and let's say maybe you don't need the full 10 days to have the house inspected and then to maybe request some repairs, you can shorten that contingency period to make yourself a little bit more com competitive. Um, when it comes to your financing contingency, what that means is you are saying, I'm going to buy this house contingent on me receiving this loan from my lender. Now, we just had a major revamp of a lot of forms um, at these contingency forms um, when we are submitting our offers. So some of the language has changed. So it's important for your realtor to explain to you uh, some of these language changes and how that affects you as the buyer. Um, one of them is the financing contingency because part of the language, it was there before, but it's a little bit different now, is that you can elect to waive your financing, financing contingency before you close on the house. What that means is you're saying, I'm confident that my loan is gonna come through I will waive this financing contingency 10 days before close and we'll be fine. And if you do that, and if something happens with your financing, something goes horribly wrong, you got to back out of the contract, but you waived your financing contingency, you're at risk to lose your earnest money that you put down. And I'm giving very generic examples here because it all depends on the terms of the contract and all contracts are different. All timelines are different, but these are different ways that you can creatively write these contracts to make yourself more competitive. Now, if you're waiving your financing contingency after a period of time before you close on the house, that can be attractive to a seller and to a listing agent, but you have to also consider the potential pitfalls as well, because there are just things you never know could potentially happen. Um, you know, when we talk about contract length, that's generally, you know, how many days to close. That's something that you want to talk to your lender about. You're going to want to ask them approximately how long do you need um, as an escrow period to close on this. For some lenders in a non-busy season, it can be 30 days. In the height of the busy season, let's say when appraisers are super busy and appraisals are taking a couple of weeks to come back, lenders might need closer to 40 days or 45 days. Have that conversation with your lender ahead of time so that when you're writing up an offer with your agent, uh, they know what to expect. And then you also want to ask your agent to try to get some information from the listing agent from the seller's point of view. What is the seller looking for? Because it's not always about money, right? I mean, everyone wants to make the most money possible. That's a given. But sometimes there's other issues that you don't know about. Let's say the seller needs extra time. Let's say that they can't move for three months, but they need to sell their house now. Well, if that's an important sticking point for them and if that works for you, that's something you can build into your contract to show them that their needs are important to you. And, you know, let's say this rent back is here on the, on the slide here. What that means is in that situation, the seller needs three months to move out of the house. You offer, it gets accepted. You um, include a rent back. Uh, form, which basically says the seller is going, we're going to close on the house. And then the seller is going to basically rent this house, their own house from me, because I'm the new owner for the next 90 days. Um, and that's kind of another situation. It all depends on what people's needs are. And sometimes it can be hard to figure out what the seller's needs are. It's your broker's responsibility to try to do that. Uh, it doesn't always work because other brokers sometimes aren't forthcoming, but you got to at least try. Um, 
sometimes it is ultimately about money, unfortunately. Um, but it's not always about the most money either. It can be the kind of money. So a person with a conventional loan that's gonna take 30 days to close and everything's pretty straightforward, might lose out to another buyer who is paying full cash and can close in a week. And the person with the loan might've offered more money. However, the person with cash, you know, it might be more attractive to a seller um, because it's a quicker close. You don't have to go through appraisal. The seller might be worried the house won't appraise for that much. So there's lots of different situations when you're in this kind of multiple offer scenario that some of them are gonna be out of your control. Most of them are gonna be out of your control. You can think that you've written the best offer in the world and you still might lose. Um, I had a client that we wrote an offer for $45,000 above ask price. And it was a very strong offer. They um, had a good amount of cash to work with as well. And we didn't get it. Um, and it can be really disheartening, but it, I think if you realize that this is just the nature of the market right now, it is what it is and you treat it with logic rather than emotion, um, it, it can be easier to kind of like swallow that hard pill and be like, okay, let's move on to the next. And with each different offer and each different situation, figure out the important things and talk to your broker about getting creative and writing the offer and how to be competitive. Always knowing that even if you are competitive, you might not always win and that's okay. You just put your head down, keep going and keep trying and persevering because eventually it will happen. Um, you just have to keep at it. Yeah, I think- That was a lot. <laughs> uh, I think at, at the end of the day, like um, it comes down to like, and this is what I appreciate you about you working with buyers that we've worked together with on before is like, as a buyer, and there's a few of you in here, the better the realtor you work with, the easier it's going to get your, it, it, the better your chances of having your offer accepted on. Because good realtors are creative about not only uh, just making offers, like Stacy was talking about with the contingencies, but creative about finding houses, right? Like having that list that's a wide search, or maybe like going into a neighborhood and just knocking on doors and saying, Hey, I have a buyer. So it, it matters well, who you work I, with. I got one more thing to add to that, Tony, is that a good realtor also has a good relationship with other realtors. There are a lot of, <laughs> there are a lot of realtors that don't like each other. So if you got a realtor, that's just kind of, you know, one of those people, you could really not have the right realtor. <laughs> um, and, and I just want to say one more thing and then I'm going to pass you the ball, Tony. Your realtor should have a good relationship with your lender as well because they should be communicating throughout the whole process. And your lender is not going to give away personal information about you or your finances to your realtor, um, but your realtor should be able to talk to your lender and be like, where are we at in the process? Um, you know, what's the next step? And they should be able to have that conversation. So it's important for everyone that you're working with, your lender, your realtor, to have open communication and have good relationships. They don't have to be best buddies, but they need to have good relationships because the whole point is working together to get you to the finish line. That's the end goal, no matter what. Um, and if you have those positive, good, working, effective relationships, that's gonna make everything so much smoother. So the, at the end of the day, you're probably going to have to go a little bit over asking, right? Even if you give up, like, you know, like Matt was saying this morning, the perfect offer is the most money and the least contingencies, right? And so if you want to keep that financing contingency, you may have to go up a little bit. Like there's some things you need to, you're probably going to have to give up something to get something in this market. So if you do go over asking price, uh, and we talked about our home price is gonna go down, 
Um, again, it's we can't necessarily like predict the future, but we can we can read into it, I guess, a little bit. But if we take a look at this, let's say we offer on a home that's three hundred thousand dollars, and the bid above we have to offer twenty five thousand dollars over that home. Um, so we're now we're now buying this home for three hundred thousand three hundred twenty five thousand dollars. What, do, what happens in, in that point, right? Like, what do we have to deal with? Well, in the history of homes, in the history of real estate, home, home values have gone up on average 4.1% per year, okay? So this $300,000, if you pay $325,000 for this house that's worth 300,000, how long is it going to take for me in that home appreciation to get my money back? And that is going to take you in this situation today, you'd be, I'm pointing at my screen. You can't see me doing that. Uh -huh. But in 2023, at the end of 2023, you would have made that $25,000 back. And so you would be flush on the house in terms of where you are. Again, that's it. An average historical appreciation. We can't necessarily count on like last year, home price appreciation was like nine or 10%. We can't count on that every year, but we can count on that average over the past 40 years of 4% that that's gonna happen over the next five years, a few of those years, okay? So now obviously there's some things you have to, other things you have to deal with in terms of appraisals and all those kind of things. But in terms of you putting money into a house that you bought, are you ever gonna get that money back? History tells us that you would get that money back in two years. Now, if that number, let's just say that number was five years just, just for fun, right? If you're only gonna live in that house for four years, you shouldn't buy that house, right? Cause you're never gonna get your money back. So those are the kind of things you need to think about. If you're working with, with me as a, as a lender, I could just run this report for you and go, hey, we're gonna offer $75 million over asking price. Am I ever gonna get my money back? I can run those numbers for you and go, here's what the numbers say, go make a decision, right? And I think that's important as you kinda, what you don't wanna do is buy a house that you're never gonna get your money back on because you're not gonna be in it long enough. You don't wanna pay discount points if you're not going to be in the house long enough to save that much money on your um, on your house. With that, there's Stacy again, and here's me. Uh, <laughs> let's. I'm going to stop sharing my screen because you saw our phone number a bunch at the beginning. Um, stop share, and then open it up for questions, if there are any. question um who finds the appraiser like is that something we have to find as buyers or you guys have people you use or it's a lender requirement so the lender will find it okay yeah because what what an appraisal does is tells the lender it's okay to loan whatever seven billion dollars yeah. on this house because the house is worth seven billion dollars okay now the inspector, on the other hand, will be you as the buyer's responsibility to hire, okay. but um, we always provide our clients with a list of recommended inspectors. You okay. don't have to use anybody we suggest, as long as you're finding somebody that is um, licensed as an inspector, uh, you can hire whoever you want, but that is the buyer's responsibility to actually do the hiring of the inspector. Okay. I'll tell you, I don't know that I've seen a home that's had zero, like they find stuff. Oh yeah. So people that just are like, no, I don't need an inspection. Like I had my, my friend look at it. It's good. Not a good idea. <laughs> but if you imagine you're going to be in this house for the next five to 10 years, at least like you're going to want to know again, what you're walking into. You want to know if there's a sewer issue or if there's a plumbing issue or if the electrical is bad. Um, 
So that's why it's so important to, to get an inspection um, because if the inspection has too many scary things and you're like, you know, I'm having second thoughts about this house, that inspection, see, inspection contingency time period is the perfect opportunity to then back out of the contract, get your earnest money back. Whereas if you don't have that inspection contingency and you just kind of decide, well, you know, I think I'm going to back out and all your other timelines have passed, that's when you kind of get into a little bit of trouble. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's a good one. My sister found, had an inspection done and they found like some crazy electrical in the panel that could have caused a fire. So, I mean, it literally could have saved them in the future, like their lives. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? And if you have questions that you don't feel like putting out into the public here, feel free to contact Tony directly. You can contact me directly as well. Or if you forget about something and think about it in three days, um, we're always around to, to help you out and answer questions and um, basically yeah, can, li lift you up throughout this whole process. I can put like a replay, maybe I can do a replay and send this to everyone if you wanted to like scroll back to anything that we covered that you may have missed. Um, mm -hmm. And then I'll include like, just I'll just send it to everyone after this and then I'll have some contact information that I'll send to you guys. If you got the event, you signed up on event, right? Cool. Excellent. Mm. All right. Thanks all right. everybody. Thank you. thank you all for being here. I super appreciate it, Tony. Thank you so much. Yeah, you bet. Have a good night. You too. Thanks everyone. Good night, everybody.